Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our first um, internal Rogers Reedy training. Um, we are, you know, once again, blessed. We are blessed. Um, we have four of the, you know, um, foremost practitioners in the insolvency space from around Australia for Norton Rose Fulbright, um, who are talking today. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're very lucky. I'll introduce them in, in a minute. Uh, but this is our first training, our first international training for Rogers Reedy. We have uh, people from New Zealand. We have our New Zealand officers. We've got uh, three officers in New Zealand and staff there for watching this, this morning. No, it's afternoon, their time. Uh, we've got our Hong Kong office. We've got our Malaysian office and also our Singapore office. Um, and in Australia, um, just for every for our Norton Rose um, friends, that uh, we have offices in all all states and territories. So we're the only for as long as we you know I can say it. I'm going to say it. We're the only firm, insolvency firm, that has offices in um, in all states and territories. So predominantly Northern Territory and Tasmania. A lot of the firms sort of miss out on that, but we we have very strong offices in that space. Um, we, you know, we've been going since the late 90s. Um, we, as I've said, Rogers Reedy started by Jeff Reedy and Peter Rogers many, many years ago. We have over 35 partners, I think, uh, you know, internationally, um, and we have over 100 staff internationally as well. And, um, yeah, so we... We, we have a, a good presence in that space. Insolvency is predominantly what we do in all our offices, but we also do um, forensics in a big area that, uh, particularly in the Melbourne office, we have a very strong forensic team in that space. So uh, that's who we are. Um, but to everyone that's watching, you know, we have sort of 70 odd people watching today from Rogers Reedy. Um, we have uh, four partners from um, Norton Rose um, from around Australia predominantly Melbourne. Um, we have Natasha Toholka, who uh, I've known for a long time and, and worked on um, a number of files with Natasha. She's from Melbourne. Um, uh, we've got Francis Drummond. Um, hi, Francis. Francis, who is from Sydney, claims to be the sunny state. <laughs> our, our Sydney office will have a good laugh about that. But um, if you're in, in Melbourne at the moment, you'll realise we are absolutely getting drenched um, at the moment, lots and lots of rain. Uh, Kachi Chung from our Melbourne office. Kachi, good afternoon. Hello. Hope you brought, hope, hope you brought your umbrella. Um, and finally, which who I've been told um, is got his own teeth. He's a Richmond supporter, Bernard O'Shea, um, proud Richmond supporter. Won lots and lots of premierships. He's, uh, he's very proud of his football team. So, uh, so. Thank you, Bernard, for turning turning up. Um, but I'll, I'll throw it to you, Natasha, to to run with it. I was, thought I'd just do a bit of an introduction and then leave it to yourselves. Thank you very much, Brent. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, you nationally and internationally. It's 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 a great turnout, and thank you for making the time. Um, like Rogers Reedy, uh, we have lots of offices in lots of places. Uh, we have a global network, as you do. Uh, so basically no insolvency or IP query is too big or too small for us, where well, there will be someone that has the know-how to, to help out. And uh, uh, having known Brent and, and the team for many years, it's been very great working with you, particularly on some of the high profile matters in the last year or so. Um, and I thought I'd take the opportunity now to introduce my partners, uh, Bernard, Francis and Karchi. Each of Bernard, Francis and Karchi uh, specialise in IP slash technology slash privacy. And together, you know, depending on what the specific query is, you'd, you'd go to one of Bernard, Francis or Karchi um, uh, because they've each got their very strong subspecialties in this broad space. But what we're doing today is having a discussion about intellectual property in insolvency appointments and basically how you get best bang for buck, how you realise those assets, how you find them and, and how you get uh, the best price for them. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to throw to Francis to kick us off today. Francis, before you speak, can I interrupt and say if anyone has any questions, 
to get onto the chat function and, um, you know, just so we can ask questions throughout, um, if that works. Sorry, France. No problem, Brent. Are you, are you controlling the slides for us? I'm not controlling the slides, but I'm controlling the chat. That is, that is, the only get given me that role. Whereas Francis, Matt, Matt, I understand is is the slide yeah. master. Matt, would you be able to go to the next slide then for the start? So, um, let, this is an overview of what we're going to talk through today. And as Natasha said, we're going to talk um, about finding IP and dealing with IP in insolvency matters. Having said that, we are bending the definition of IP. So, those of you who um, know anything about IP will find we're, we're going to talk about lots of other things like data and a bit of privacy. Um, so we're going to look a little bit about the basics of how you find intellectual property. And I should say to all the international guests, we are we will be focusing on looking for things in the Australian context, but I have actually practiced in Asia and largely what we're going to say applies across particularly the common law jurisdictions in Asia. And the common law being the British derived jurisdictions, so you're seeing for Hong Kong, Malaysia, New Zealand, very similar to Australia in any event. Um, so, uh, but the law in relation to some of the specifics that Bernard and Kachi will cover would be slightly different depending on the jurisdiction. So take the overarching principle as being appropriate, but the specific laws may well have to be adapted. And as Natasha said, we have offices um, across Asia. So if you need specific information, um, do feel free to ask questions. There will be questions going through the chat as Brent suggested, but obviously also if you can't go away, please don't die in a ditch worrying about something. Please feel free to email any of us. We'd be happy to, to follow up on anything today. So we're, we're going to go a little bit through how do you find IP generally? Um, due diligence. So whilst um, you often won't be doing due diligence as such, you will be more likely setting up, for example, vendor, uh, vendor due diligence, if you like. So you'll be setting up um, different options for purchasers to have a look at the rights. So we're going to talk a little bit about, well, how do you set that report up so that it looks good? Dealing with rights that are, we call IP, but aren't IP. So domain names and that sort of thing. Um, a little bit about valuation. How do we go about valuing um, intellectual property? We obviously, because of time, we'll be skating over these in, in um, not huge detail, but um, we will cover them all off. Uh, Bernard and Kachi will talk about the hard end of intellectual property. So dealing with the transfers, the warranties, the stuff that keeps you awake at night and the stuff that really keeps you awake at night, privacy and how we manage uh, privacy in insolvency deals. Next slide, please, Matt. So obviously you guys have all been involved and as Natasha said, you've been involved with the firm in a number of collapses. You'd obviously didn't act on all of these. We thought we'd give our focus to the retail sector because obviously in the current times, we are seeing retail suffering the most and particularly in relation to uh, post-COVID world. Um, so with COVID and also the sort of globalization of brands and the moving into the market of all these um, the Zara's and the H&M's and these sorts of companies, you, some of the Australian businesses just haven't made it out. And obviously you see marks down in the left-hand corner and I know that you guys acted on that mark still. These are examples of, of companies where intellectual property is the very core of their asset base. And obviously for marks, they did manage to trade out by being purchased and they're trading under those very valuable brands still and David Lawrence together, obviously. Um, why I picked these different companies was because they all actually demonstrate a different way in which you can trade out or restructure depending on what the asset base is. So SES, for example, it went, moved to a wholly online, got rid of all its bricks and mortar stores. Topshop, as those of you who know the brand, very um, a team brand, I suppose, one would define it from the United Kingdom. When Topshop and Topman went into receivership here in Australia, the licenses were pulled and those organizations just don't exist anymore. So really depends on whether you're looking at a company that's under some international license structure or alternatively a local brand, whether it, if, it could be, if it couldn't be sold in its entirety, then can they restructure and keep using the valuable intellectual property? So we'll sort of, that was just a few illustrations, nothing magical about the, um, those particular companies. Uh, next slide, Matt. You, you mentioned Marks there. You, you've got the administrator on. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's what we've also, we're, we're um, Shane is the administrator currently on Ishka. Um, and, uh, you know, many, many stores around Australia, same sort of issues. Yeah, I mean, it's been interesting to see if you even look at like C Poly, for example, another example of a, 
Um, so Marks and David Lawrence is, is a similar example where if you put the brands of two sort of theoretically independent organizations together, sometimes that can be a better saleable whole and the um, C Folly and Jets was an example of that. You take two brands that are both struggling and that became a viable business that could be sold on. So there's lots of different ways, but with intellectual properties at the core, there are plenty of structuring options to, to move on as the Marks example, which you guys are very well versed with. So how to find the IP? Well, you know, at first blush, you might think, hey, well, that's not that hard. We, you know, there'll be a lovely filing cabinet somewhere with everything all neatly ordered into it. And um, there'll be, you know, everything will be protected on searchable registers. Yay, ready to go. Sadly, that's rarely the case, and particularly in companies that are struggling financially, it's often the case that they've ceased to do the right thing by their assets, in particular in intellectual property. And so you may find there's a bit of disarray happening. Um, so we're going to talk you through where the places we go to hunt when we're asked to try and gather the IP of a particular company. Um, that next slide, please. So the easy place to go is to the registers. And in Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, everybody who's on, on the um, on the Zoom today, there are registers of intellectual property in your countries, and they largely operate in the same way. So there are registers in almost every country of trademarks, patents, designs. The company of business names will, will separate, separate out because they aren't really IP. There are also registers of other things depending on the nature of the businesses. So plant register rights. So if you happen to be looking at an agribusiness, you might also look there. There are also in the United States and in China registers of copyright, which we don't have in Australia. Um, so registered rights are relatively easy to find if you know how to operate and look into the registers. The company names, business names and domain names, we, we, we call these quasi IP rights. They're not IP rights at all, in fact, under the definition of IP rights internationally accepted but they often get basketed together with the IP rights in a deal because they're relevant. So the company name may well be the trademark of the business or the domain name may well contain the trademark of the business. And so we, 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 we generally bunch them together and there are registers for company business names. You'll all be familiar with the ASIC register and the domain names are registered by numerous entities. Um, the PPSR, that's an Australian specific register. There is an equivalent in New Zealand and I don't, know the position in the other Asian countries. The PPSR is a specific register. I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec, but that's a place where you look for um, personal security registration. So that goes broader than intellectual property, but intellectual property assets are recorded on it. Next slide, um, Brett. So when I said it's simple, if you've got a registry, you just go and search the rights. Sadly, it's actually not simple. It's very technically complex. Um, you can access the registers using the links that I've put here for, and they talk about a quick search. Um, but those searches are fabulous if you're just trying to verify, does this registration exist? But if you're doing a proper search to make sure something's available for you, that's a really specialist task that's done by specialists. And I'm not one of those specialists. I interpret the data, but I don't do the data collection myself. We use specialist external providers for that. And patents, even more challenging, whilst it is very possible to look up a patent on the patent register, we, we could all sort of work out how to do that. Certainly Bernard Tachi and I know how to do it. The key with the patents is making sure that the patent you've got registered actually covers the technology of the company. So actually doing a patent search is almost worthless if you don't know what you're looking for. So whilst it looks like it's a simple thing, verification is not simple. It requires a bit of thought. And then the fact that you find a registration and you present a lovely, beautiful register doesn't really mean any of that intellectual property is valuable. And the patents in particular, um, you, if you've got a patent that covers a different technology to the technology which is core to the business, then having a registration is not worth the paper it is written on in, in old um, uh, analogy. So um, basically registered doesn't mean valuable, it just means that it means registered. So searching and working out what the the value of particular assets is, is a specialist task that is best left to those who know um, what to do. Having said that, you could find in one of your companies a, a beautifully rich register of assets that are not being used by the business. And there are some really, really good examples of global companies like Kodak and IBM who at one point to, to raise money just decided, let's go in our back catalogue and sell off some of the patents that we've registered but we don't use. So there, the fact that it's registered doesn't mean it's instantly valuable, but it could be valuable to someone else. You know, to say one person's treasures, another person's trash all the way around, one person's trash, another person's treasure. So you could be able to find 
So particularly if you go into a tech company, tech companies do often register lots and lots of patents because they're looking for the next great thing. And it may well be that they, the patents they've got do have value to another business or another entity. And there are lots of auction houses and places where you can sell um, patents that are sort of uh, redundant, so to speak, but that, that still are registered and therefore have value from an enforcement perspective. Um, and then obviously, when you look at those registers, you'll see loads and loads of language. So you'll see uh, restrictions and um, limitations recorded. And if you don't understand the limitations, you may not understand what it is that you are trying to sell. And obviously, when you have due diligence done on assets you're trying to sell by other, other firms, they will understand what those limitations are and be very quick to point them out to you. So it's good, obviously, to know upfront what, what the limitations are of the rights that you've got. And with that, I will pass over to Bernard to cover off the next slide, and Matt probably goes to the next slide with you. Perfect. Thank you. You're on mute, Bernard. Technology is too hard for some technology lawyers. That, that phrase, Bernard, um, well, you, you're still on mute, but that phrase, you're on mute, um, has been, I wonder how many times it's been said in the last 12 months. It, uh, you know. He's still on mute. <laughs> He's got it. Yay. I do have my on mute symbol, which is this, but uh, it doesn't seem to have been taken up universally. Is that what it is? Is it? You do that? Yeah. Isn't that some sort of dance move? Is that the Macarena? It's from TikTok. He's obviously watches TikTok in his watch lifetime. TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, on mute. Um, <laughs> Francis has, has talked about the, the IP you can find on registers, but typically we find in, in businesses there's a lot of other IP that's that's floating around. It's important that it's not only IP that you want to potentially sell for value, but it's also potentially IP that you need to operate the business. Um, so some starting points uh, that you might consider are the, the asset register. Um, maybe if they're a software development company, you'll find a software listing and, listing and that'll give you some clues to where to go. Often companies that are developing IP are making R&D claims. So again, that might give you a clue, look through their R&D claims to see what they've been spending money on and, and claiming uh, development rights for. Uh, if you're really lucky, a, a well-run business will have a contract register and you'd hope that that would capture things which are, are leading to uh, IP rights, either ones that are coming into the business or which have been uh, licensed or maybe transferred to others. Uh, the databases that are floating around the, around the business, particularly like a, a customer database, or uh, can be um, particularly important um, either in terms of uh, the clientele and customers of the business, or just in terms of data, um, because we're seeing a lot of transactions now where our significant attention is being paid to the data that's been collected by the by the business. Um, obviously, looking at the business uh, and seeing what the business has said to the outside world by by using the search engine of your choice um, to basically round out the picture. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, we sort of, um, I suppose, just briefly touched upon the two types of business we've, we're seeing uh, and the categories of IP that might be associated with them. So the old, uh, the bricks and mortar presence um, with the IP that maybe people don't regard it as the classical IP, but it's often um, a particularly valuable aspect of the business. So for Apple, uh, things like store layouts, um, for, for branding um, and get up the, the, the Tiffany model um, from start to finish is a particularly interesting one. Um, the sense that the, the sense that you get uh, when you go into a body shop or Peter Alexander, um, which effectively is the hallmark of that business. Um, and data and loyalty cards, which are often used on a standalone basis within a business can be particularly uh, important. Um, software, which which is uh, part of the payment facilities and the way in which the business operates can be uh, critical. So that's more an asset that needs to be secured for the purposes of transfer. Uh, and someone like Seafolly where their designs uh, and the use of copyright and so forth to protect those designs is important. Uh, next slide. Um, often we're seeing businesses which are either online, um, an increasingly uh, common event or the online presence of a bricks and mortar business. So there, the things that are critical tend to be the data and database that, that sits behind that. Um, the patents that uh, that might be being used uh, or might be available. So, I mean, the Amazon one click is quite a famous one, uh, 
quite valuable, whether you're going to encounter business with something like that uh, might be uh, reasonably uh, unlikely. But uh, if that IP is being used in the business, then you need to make sure there are rights to it, which are potentially transferable. We've touched on the domain names um, and obviously they can be particularly valuable and obviously very critical to the continued flow of a custom to that business or to the successor of the business. Um, social media accounts, um, again, another category of things that aren't IP, but uh, are really a part of the, uh, the makeup of the business and important to deal with them. Kachi will talk about those in due course. Uh, and obviously the software, particularly the websites and the, and the smarts that sit behind that to remember customers to um, you know, keep their cart live uh, and uh, to potentially scale what they've purchased and, uh, and advise them of additional things. So that's I hope, hopefully given you a, a taster of some of the dimensions of a business that you might need to look at. So I now pass back to, to Francis and the next slide to talk around uh, due diligence. Bernard, just before we, we um, go to Kachi, uh, another way which we implement is getting on the phone to uh, the, the uh, company's solicitor accountant and, and having a conversation quite often, you know, it's, it's them, it's their department their IP department has put together, you know, for a long period of time. So we, we've found some stuff that way, just by having a conversation. It's always always good to do that. Yes, and I, I think the other thing we've found is it's some businesses don't necessarily appreciate what they've got in the nature of IP that's valuable. Um, and uh, yes, I, so eliciting that from management can be quite difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, sorry, Kachi, you uh, interrupted. No, moving on to Francis. That's okay. Um, but actually, it, it, it's an interesting question about asking questions. And obviously, when we're, we're going to talk a little bit about due diligence, but um, what Bernard says is quite right. There's when we do a lot of work, which isn't necessarily in the insolvency space, but really more in the um, growing for market space, but which could end up in an insolvency because these are a lot of startup businesses. So a lot of startup businesses, you know, fail to launch, so to speak. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding amongst particularly um, startup directors about what intellectual property they've created, who owns it. You know, directors who started on business assume everything they've created belongs to the business, it doesn't. So you get a lot of um, misunderstanding. So quest asking questions in relation to intellectual property is super important. And it's also super important to keep digging and ask the right questions and just so you get to the very bottom. Because I've actually sat on very senior um, conversations with, you know, managing directors and general counsels where the questions asked, do you own all your copyright? Absolutely, we own your copyright. And then you say, so um, who created it? Oh, yeah, we have it all created in Thailand. Yeah, and so all those people work for you. Well, no, they're all independent contractors. They're just, so you, 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 do you own your copyright? The answer is yes. But actually, when you start to dig deeper, unfortunately, you find out that there's just not an understanding about what ownership looks like. And, and so that is super important to keep doing the digging you just talked about. So obviously, when you're going to bring um, an opportunity to market, it is best if you've done due diligence before you put it to market, you know, as we, we always sort of say in the legal profession, if you say if something a package is put out in a really organized fashion, it makes you feel much more comfortable about the asset you're buying. And I think intellectual property can be a very good barometer of how well the business is running, even though it may well be heading into an insolvency situation that may be completely independent of the fact that the company has been, been well run, it may well just be market conditions and particularly with the COVID situation. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. So how do you go about working besides uh, just doing cheer register searches? How do you go about auditing the intellectual property rights and getting them into a sensible place? So the trademarks, patents, and possibly designs we've talked about, you can go and look for those on registers. You can look for them on the PPSR. We luckily did include a slide on global here. Um, so obviously trademark registers pattern register, design registers are country specific. So you may have heard that there are international treaties that govern, or govern all of these intellectual property rights. That's right. But there's no such a thing as an international registration, even if it's called that, which it is in relation to trademarks, called an international registration. That's literally a basket of individual rights in different countries. So if you're doing 
um, due diligence and you include you're going to be including multiple jurisdictions you've one got to include a budget to do that to do the searching and checking in those countries and the other you've got to leave time because searching in countries that are not on the mainstream you know us um europe main parts of asia can take weeks so if you go into some of the smaller asian countries for example it's a it's a big job some registers aren't even electronic yet sadly um so auditing is a job that takes time and a bit of effort uh, Matt, next slide. We are not going to spend long on the PPSR because it is possibly one next to the tax legislation of the most boring acts ever known to man. So those of you who love pub Public Property Securities Act, I'm really sorry about that. Um, so this is a, a register of assets, as you, as you those Australian um, practitioners would know. Um, so that PPSR includes intellectual property assets. So it's a very good place to start. Um, there is actually an ability to have securities registered in on the various intellectual property registers, but that is really hit and miss. So you may well find securities registered there, but not necessarily. So the PPSR is the one truth in Australia and in New Zealand. Um, your, your, you've got your own um, register, register, which is the same. Um, moving right along. So we've talked a lot about rights that are registered and registrable. Um, some companies exist entirely on licensed rights. And we talked at the beginning a little about um, Topshop in, in Australia and Topshop um, in, in particular was licensed out of a, a United Kingdom company. I just want to give these two examples, not, not for any reason other than they are companies in Australia operating wholly on licensed rights. So the Sarah Lee trademark, um, you may know that's a global company that's got lots and lots of different businesses. The Australian and New Zealand and Asian businesses actually were sold to McCain about hmm, eight years ago. And the sale only included a license of the Sara Lee brand for, for political and technical reasons. So that that's still a valuable asset in the hands of the Australian company because in fact, it's got a bankruptcy protected structure to make sure that um, that is available to sell in the event of an insolvency either by the license or the licensee. So, um, and Virgin's the same, obviously, all the Virgin businesses operate under a license. That doesn't mean the assets aren't valuable, but it does mean you may not be free to do the things with those assets that you are with registered assets owned by the business. So there'll often be change of control provisions, and Vernon may come on to talk about this later, and there will also be restrictions on what you can do in the event of an insolvency. And you, as you, you guys will know, sometimes when businesses that are operating under an international license go with into a position where they're unable to trade um, successfully, it's quite often possible that the overseas licensor will buy back the assets. And I just picked an example, the Jamie Oliver business, uh, you'll probably remember, there were restaurants operating in Australia, Keystone was operating them, went into um, liquidation, and um, Jamie's company in the United Kingdom decided to buy back those assets itself rather than let them be sold with the rest of the Keystone assets too another PE firm or whatever. So there are options with licensed rights, but often the problem with them is that they will come with very heavy restrictions. And I guess that's where you probably have to bring in the likes of Bernard and Karchi to assess for you what are those restrictions and make sure those licenses are well understood before you put them up for sale. And passing right along back to Bernard, we are going to go into the complex topic of patents. Um, for those of you who deal with businesses that are sort of in the tech space. So over to you, Bernard. Uh, thanks, Francis. The um, unmuted this time. So I think uh, pa patents are really interesting because the uh, you can't uh, tell the, the value of a patent from its number, um, and you can't even really tell the value of a patent from uh, from reading it. Um, there's so much that surrounds it uh, in terms of of the of the worth of a patent. So that uh, what Francis said before about the needing need to understand what other patents uh, might exist, uh, what freedom to operate there is. Um, in fact, some patents can actually represent a liability because the, um, uh, the exercise of them by the business might uh, mean that some other person's patent is being infringed. But nonetheless, uh, they uh, are a, um, a high profile registered form of, of, of IP. There's quite an important distinction between granted patents and, and patents uh, that are at the application stage. And often um, a company that's uh, cash constrained will have found itself um, unable to pay the fees to take a, a patent application through to what's known as national phase. Um, and basically in the patent world, 
uh, a patent application goes through stages. And if the fees aren't paid at the relevant stages, uh, the patent will die. Um, so this can often be a, a quite a significant time constraint around what might be a very valuable asset uh, sitting in, in a, in a in solvent business. Also, in terms of, of a, patented, uh, a patent that exists within a business, there'll be lots of other valuable assets which might be valuable both in terms of working the patent, but also in terms of protecting it. And I highlight two notebooks and, and know-how. Notebooks typically being maintained by the people that create uh, patents. Another thing that's very potentially very important, and again, in respect of patent applications is preserving confidentiality. So you need to be very careful about the disclosures that are being made about the inventions that might be included in patent applications, which can obviously confound your sale process. Uh, next slide, please. So just dwelling on licenses, um, I think the point here is that, that you've got an intellectual property asset, so something like a patent or a trademark, but the licenses basically turn to the world of contracts um, and the terms of those contracts uh, and whether and the multiple variables of them. And I've mentioned a couple of the critical terms that you might find in licenses. And bearing in mind, these might be licenses into a, a business facing insolvency for its use of assets that are critical to its operation or potentially licenses of intellectual property owned by the business or controlled by the business to third parties which generate income. So is the license perpetual, which is not uncommon, or is it for a fixed term? Is there a change of control provision that could potentially bring the license or allow the license to be brought to the, an end by the counterparty? Is the license a local license or is it a global license or for some specific region? Uh, importantly, is it an exclusive license or a non-exclusive license? Um, an exclusive license is obviously, um, maybe not so obviously, but is, is gives you a right um, against all others um, to use that intellectual property right, whereas a non-exclusive license means that the right is shared. And obviously the termination events, and as you might expect, uh, nearly any license will have a provision that uh, provides for termination on insolvency. And so the application of the ipso facto reforms in that context and exactly what that means comes to the fore. So um, I spend a great deal of time looking through licenses, negotiating licenses, uh, and the permutations and combinations of things that can go right and the things that can be do are wrong, can go wrong are quite profound, but uh, that's for another day. So I'd like now to, to hand over to Karchi to talk about some of the categories of not traditional IP, but nonetheless things that we're seeing in businesses that are particularly valuable. Thanks, Bernard. Um, so yeah, so I, I'll spend um, the next little while talking about some of the categories of um, uh, semi IP type of assets that you, you're going to come across and increasingly um, valuable. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the first one is, is on domain names, um, which is relatively straightforward. And I think um, Francis touched upon this a, um, a moment ago. Um, the main thing to notice, obviously, domain name is not really what we call hard intellectual property but rather ultimately a contractual license uh, for the business to use the domain name on the internet. And so ownership um, per se is really around the contractual registration and is governed by contract and also the various policies um, issued by non-government type of bodies reg um, uh, regulating those internet domain names. Uh, at a practical level, selling domain names, so to speak, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, all you need to do uh, is to um, is to have a transfer process. You need to find the domain names, obviously, um, and it is again pretty straightforward to verify the ownership of a given domain name. And again, in the in the context of a insolvent um, business, if you are given a register of the domain names that purportedly owned by that business, relatively straightforward to to um, to identify or to verify the ownership. What is more difficult? is to do the reverse. Namely, you're given the business, business name, and you need to find out what domain names are registered by the business because, for example, they don't have a good record of that. That is actually more difficult and potentially a quite expensive type of search known as a, a reverse who is search. Um, and once you know what domain names um, is owned by the business, transferring that is really just following the, um, the process uh, dictated by the registrar in question. Most of the processes these days are handled completely online and typically requires the purchaser to have a account with the same registrar. So um, a, um, a, a particular um, online register like um, um, 
off the top of my head, can't think of a particular register, uh, register.com, for example, uh, what you need to know is to find out who within the business actually has the domain key. And that's critical because without the domain key, you can't really transfer the registration um, to another person. So a lot of this is really around um, digging through to make sure that uh, the business still has those records uh, handy for you to, to be able to pass on to purchaser. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, next two slides. Yeah, next one. Uh, social media. Um, so this is a, um, uh, it's an interesting topic. Uh, unfortunately, social media is still a bit of a wild west. Uh, and whilst social media accounts are increasingly valuable to a lot of businesses, everything is typically governed still by the platform terms. So if you're on Facebook, you have a Facebook set of T's and C's that you need to comply with. If you're on LinkedIn, if you're on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. And those terms will govern what you can and cannot do with those social media accounts. There's no general rule that you can easily um, apply. The other difficulty is that a lot of these social media networks obviously are born out of interfacing with individuals. So their T's and C's are focused on individual users rather than um, sort of corporate type of accounts owned by a, a business. And that's where it gets um, more tricky because the focus of the exercise when you're managing or, or trying to trade um, the insolvent company is to work out who has access to those social media, social media accounts and also to stop others from claiming the social media accounts and then using it, for example. So what you need to do is really literally find out who the account holder is. Uh, is it, for example, the head of marketing, the head of digital marketing, or alternatively, it could start from the founder of the business. So again, a lot of these startups, they originally started off as an individual and the social media account may well be registered in the personal email address of the founder, for example, and trying to get those assigned to a purchaser potentially is more, is more difficult. Um, the social media content is an interesting, um, it's an interesting um, uh, uh, issue to consider. Really, the main thing is around to, to verify the ownership of the underlying copyright to the content. So um, Francis mentioned before, you need to think of whether or not the company itself um, create those content or their own staff, or alternatively, do they, do they outsource it to an external uh, management um, company? And if so, what are the terms and conditions around the treatment of intellectual property ownership? Uh, next slide, please. Again, jump on two slides. Um, the data and database, um, I will uh, focus, spend a bit of time on, on this because largely data is considered a very extremely valuable asset class, um, particularly for businesses that deal directly with consumers. Um, unfortunately though, data is not a recognized class of legal property per se. So this makes the concept of trying to preserve, to identify the assets and to sell the assets a bit more tricky. So for example, you can think of data really as individual pieces of information. And when there's large enough collection of that information, they become valuable because it takes time and effort to gather them. And like other intangible properties, once you know it, and once you have a copy of it, it is relatively simple to duplicate. So the concept of declaring ownership over data and then purport to sell it to a purchaser is actually quite problematic. So at the, at the Oh, there's a, there's a question which we'll come to in a second. Business that doesn't have a cannot domain key, can it be sourced from the registry? Um, there's, a, there's a question being asked on the, um, on the forum. Um, oh, that is an interesting question. I, I think I need to take that on, on notice here. Um, it's not straightforward. I think there are, there are mechanisms available for you to demonstrate um, ownership, so to speak. Uh, but typically without domain keys, the main thing is there's, there's a time constraint. You need to go through that process to convince the registrar to, um, to assign you the new key. Um, but typically there is a way around it, but there's no, there's no, simple, um, there's no simple answer. Um, so going back, back to, the, to the data, um, uh, as I mentioned before, data is not a legal class registered per se. Uh, but instead, at the legal level, really is a hodgepodge of different legal concepts. And some of them I've mentioned on the slide here. So there's a bit of copyright, potentially it's a bit of database rights, if any, a bit of confidential information and also privacy as well. And so when you're looking at a, 
uh, trying to assess the data assets of a business and to work out, well, can you sell it? How much is it worth, et cetera? You need to look at it from these um, different lenses. Um, database in particular, I think is a very interesting question. Again, going back to what Bernard and Francis mentioned before, uh, the, the understanding of a business uh, is quite different from necessarily what is the position at law. A lot of business do treat database as if it was a protectable um, uh, intellectual property right, and they treat it as such. Um, unfortunately, though, it's not a trivial question at copyright law. It used to be the case that there is this so-called sweat of the brow test that if you put enough efforts into compiling something, the law would recognize that as a copyright and therefore becomes a proper class of intellectual property. But that is increasingly being challenged. And I think you do need to look at the specifics uh, and to obtain legal advice on this specific uh, database in question to work out or not whether there is really a intellectual property in, in the form of copyright that can be protected. There are lots of things these days like automated data collection, for example, they're fundamentally um, different from the way copyright was envisaged back when, when, it was, uh, when, when it was created. And so there are lots of tricky things happening with, with how data and database is collected such that you can't automatically assume data, database, no matter how big or how complicated it is, that it is going to, going to be protected at law. And if you can't protect it at law, then you need to think about um, how you can protect it from a, from a contractual perspective and what you can do to, a, um, uh, to assign it to a purchaser. Um, so next slide, please. So I drew, I drew down a bit more into the type of data that you may come across in the, in the insolvent business that you may, um, you may be managing. A um, couple of comments there. The, the first thing is, it is highly unlikely that all data being used or held by the business are going to be collected and used exclusively um, by the business. So by that, I mean, various data may be licensed in and may be licensed out. So I'll give a good example. There are lots of businesses that are known as data aggregators. They, protect, they, they produce market intelligence reports and some of our clients actively um, acquire those reports. Um, the data licensing deals involving those data aggregators are generally two-way street. So on the one hand, the data aggregator provides the market intelligence report to the business. On the other hand, the business also submits data to the aggregator for them to contribute back to the report and that's contractual. There are also sort of big data analysis type of um, service offering out there. Again, what they do is they, they help businesses for the allowing the business to throw its data into the data lake, do a bunch of big data analysis, provide some enrichment, some extra insights. Then the business can drag that in, um, enriched data back out for their own use. But again, the quid pro quo is that the data needs to be thrown back into the data lake for others to use as well. So the common theme across all of these things is that Data is really, a data used by the business may well be licensed in and therefore subject to contractual restrictions in terms of what you can and cannot do with it. And secondly, there may be contractual obligations on the business to throw data back out again. So the, the, the complexity here is to understand what sort of contracts um, govern these sort of data in order to work out what type of um, arrangements a purchaser may be subject to and therefore affect the value of that particular asset. Um, there's a couple of questions on the, on the line. Uh, responsibility of appointee for data breaches prior to appointment. Mm, um, that is also a very interesting um, question. Uh, I think the company would be generally um, uh, be responsible for the relevant data breaches. I'm not aware of any specific carve out per se um, for in relation to appointees. So again, probably need to take that on notice unless Bernard or Natasha, you can comment on that issue, but we can uh, we can take that on notice. And Kachi, I see one of the questions is about mitigating the privacy risks. This is always something that comes up yes. about selling databases and- Yes. Um, we what would you be advising? In ah, yes. Well, in fact, I'm, I'm going to come back to this. Um, I have a whole section on privacy. So we'll come to that in a, in a sec. Yes, there are. There, indeed, privacy is, a, is an important question, particularly around customer database. So we'll, um, we'll definitely deal, uh, uh, deal with that uh, later on in the, um, in, the, in the presentation. And 
Uh, and then the final one, oh, that's another, that is the other very tricky one, um, Natasha. In the event of insolvency, there's a usual moratorium on proceedings, how IP claims and data breaches dealt particularly in the VA. Um, um, I mean, the, the, the takeaway, and we, we can come back, take this question on notice with more detail, but the, the general takeaway is, as an IP, comply with the law, uh, take advice and comply. So while you're in there and you're complying and you've taken advice, um, you should be all right, you should be okay. Um, the, issue, the more interesting issue, I think, is the would you have liability as a current IP for past conduct? I'm going to take that away. I'm not aware of a case on that, but... Uh, don't quote me, we'll get back to you. Thanks, Natasha. Um, so in interest of time, uh, maybe we'll move on uh, to the next slide as well. Um, so this little slide here is really a, a checklist of things um, for you to consider whenever you're looking at the major data assets. Uh, this is sort of the type of questions you have. Um, it would be very useful to have answers to these questions, um, either the, the business or, or uh, through the due diligence process, because the more you can answer these questions, um, the, the higher the confidence a purchaser is going to put on it. Um, I'm going to talk about consent in, in a sec when we come back to privacy, but to, to the earlier point about what is the tip and strategies to, to adopt, uh, to mitigate privacy risks, that question, I suppose I can't stress enough the value of a properly well-managed CRM with a well-managed register of consents. If you go into the business and they have one of these things well-managed, chances are they have considered the privacy implications and the privacy risk associated with the data that they collect. And it should give you a lot more comfort in terms of what you can and cannot do with it. And conversely, a purchaser looking into this are going to have much more comfort in attributing value to that database because they know they can do something with that data. Um, without it, if you have a hodgepodge of Excel spreadsheets, etc., uh, that will be far more tricky. And chances are, not many purchasers are going to subscribe too much value to that um, to that particular set of um, database. Um, Comingo data, I'll mention because that's actually quite profound and is is a is a very tricky question to 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 deal with. Um, what I mean by Comingo data is, as I mentioned before, data is likely going to be licensed in. For, for any particular business. And in some instances, that data gets sort of captured and residing within the business itself. And so you have this mix of original data collected by the company for, and combined with licensing data. So for example, we've, we've acted for a client in, um, several years ago on, in relation to what was known as a CRM enhancement services. So this particular service provider provides um, a service to update the contact database of its customers. Uh, in this case, our, our client, um, who took the service for a number of years. But then several years down the track, when they wanted to get out of that arrangement, unfortunately, what they discovered is that they actually can't get out because the terms that they agreed to as part of signing up to the CRM enhanced services is that they have agreed to treat all of the enhanced data to be licensed data. And the license is term-based. In other words, termination of the agreement results in termination of the licensed data. The trouble is that it is almost impossible to work out what is licensed data versus what is original data. So that is the type of arrangements that can really um, uh, throw a spanner into, into the works of the value of any particular database if it is subject to these sort of arrangements. Um, so um, I, think, uh, I think that's about all I want to say in relation to these slides in the, in the interest of time. And I'll go to the next couple of slides to focus on some um, data assets that I will just touch on. Um, next slide, please. Um, so license components, I think Bernard mentioned the, the license um, previously. Uh, most business technology assets are licensed in. And again, the main issue is to work out which of those assets are actually used by the company and which are critical to business and then work out whether it can be transferred as a bundle to the purchaser uh, and what you need to do with that. In practice, what we're seeing is more and more integrated solutions. Basically, a business is going to buy multiple point solutions, get a integrated, integrate them all in, and then, uh, and then that forms the solution. So uh, trying to sell that as an asset or trying to pass that off to a purchaser is pretty much an all or nothing type of um, uh, um, uh, type of deal and involves dealing with multiple ID vendors. 
the good news is that dealing with IT vendors is not that difficult, um, particularly in insolvency context. What we tend to find is that IT vendors like to deal with a sovereign purchaser rather than insolvent existing business. So uh, sometimes it's actually not too difficult just to have a have a conversation with the with the relevant IT vendors for all of those contracts to be assigned as part of a sale to a to a purchaser. Um, owned components, uh, Bernard again mentioned that before. And it's, a, it's again, it's a, it's a common trap that we find in many businesses, what the business thinks they own may not be owned by them or they couldn't demonstrate that they own. And it is a repeating issue. And again, it's all to do with the, the record keeping of the organization, whether they've got contracts um, in place and it's your typical type of due diligence question that you need to ask in order to really trace the ownership detail, uh, particularly for something like copyright in Australia, where there is no register per se. You need to you need to establish ownership in order to prove the value to the um, to your purchaser. Uh, mobile apps is a, is an interesting um, uh, is an interesting topic. Um, uh, the mobile apps are governed not just by the copyright, for example, but also by the terms of the mobile app store and the development terms. So for example, the Google store and the, and the, app, sorry, the Google play and the Apple stores, et cetera. Uh, what you need to do is to verify who is the publisher of the app on those stores itself, because from the app store's perspective, they assume that the author or the publisher is the owner of that app. And that may not necessarily be the company. For example, we've had one case where the business that we're acting for, um, um, acting for, uh, actually own the underlying copyright, but they engage an external developer to manage the app. And on the web store, the 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 publisher of that app is actually not the company, but rather the external provider. So when we were trying to deal with that transaction, we had to get that particular registration transferred to either to the purchaser or back to the business in order for that app to be legally recognized per se by the, by the app store to be owned by the business. Um, so I think, okay, sorry. Um, I think given time, um, there's gonna be a section to, um, we're, we're gonna jump to um, valuing, valuation, but I think given to time, I was gonna to throw to Francis. I wonder whether we're gonna jump straight back into, into, um, into privacy. Yeah, since there were some questions asked on privacy, while there is some astonishingly interesting content that we could have gone through, we think we'll jump to privacy. And if any of you are interested, we're happy to come back and do a more detailed sort of brand valuation and licensing piece at another time. So because I think the privacy is some questions have been asked, so better to do that. Thanks, Kachi. Great. Okay. Yes. Okay, um, so a lot of you have asked um, asked about privacy. Uh, so I, I won't go into the, the importance of why, reasons why this is important. Um, just quick, give a quick um, refresher before I go into some of the details and in the, in the tips and and and, um, and tricks. The first thing is to recognize that privacy law regulates personal information. In other words, information that identifies an individual. Um, there is no such thing as corporate personal information in Australia. Again, it's a common misunderstanding. So things like that purely relate to a company like the financial data, the sales information, who are their suppliers, et cetera, generally are not going to be regulated by privacy laws. Um, instead, the customer database more likely to be regulated by privacy laws. Um, the second important thing to note is that privacy law generally doesn't regulate change of control. Uh, now that's probably less less valuable in, in the context of insolvency sale, but in a typical sale, if it was a share sale deal, for example, it can avoid a lot of the potential privacy issues, um, at least from the vendor's perspective, because privacy laws from their, from, from the, in that lens, still looking at the company uh, and the information collected by that company. The purchaser may have issues down the track, but that's, that's sort of the issue you get um, for, for the purchaser. Um, what is, um, what is a tricky question is when we're often asked about this is how and when to notify individuals of a transaction, uh, particularly around who sends out that message and what the message actually says to the individual because of the risk associated with, well, someone's going to allege there's a privacy breach. Someone is going to say, well, I don't want so-and-so to know my personal information, et cetera. Um, I'll come to this in a sec, but I think as um, Natasha mentioned before, the key issue here is really for you as the um, administrator or, or the um, insolvency practitioner to avoid triggering a privacy breach. 
which can expose the business and also by extension, you to potentially fines and, and penalties. Um, I've mentioned sort of privacy and data breaches and sort of lumped together. Um, and they are usually treated as the same thing, but they're not quite the same thing. Um, data breach can indicate some type of privacy issues. Uh, and we, in Australia at least, have a mandatory data breach notification regime, uh, which requires businesses to basically own up and to publish certain types of data breaches to the individuals and to the regulator. Uh, but privacy is more than just data security. So having a good security, having no security incidents does not necessarily mean compliance with privacy laws. Uh, you can still interfere with someone's privacy without a data breach. And conversely, a data breach may not necessarily mean breach of privacy as well. So we'll go into next slide, please. Um, and what to look for. Okay, so somebody asked about tips and tips and tricks. I, I think it's very similar to what we've been saying um, in, in this presentation, a lot of it comes down to how well the business has been um, treating these type of information. So uh, I have put on here sort of a list of things that again, you should be asking for to see whether you, you see them in the business. Um, you should really have no issues with getting copies of the privacy policy and collection statements. Um, and ideally, current and historical versions as well. For any consumer-focused business that regularly collects personal information, uh, if they don't have that, uh, I think you're in deep trouble, in, or the business is in deep trouble, in terms of its ability to really commercialize that particular set of database. Uh, they really should be able to provide with what I call consent artifacts. And again, important um, uh, for the purposes of potential transfer. Now, these are what I mean by consent artifacts are basically either online forms or physical forms that the business has used to obtain customer's consent, particularly around things like direct marketing. Um, and this is important because that is what you and potentially the purchaser will need to use and work out and rely upon in order to, um, for, the, for, the, uh, for the individual to potentially receive further direct marketing and to also provide information to the individual about the sale of the company to a purchaser, for example. Um, if a business has done the breach incident uh, plan, that is certainly a good idea, but not necessarily all businesses will have it. Um, we have had situations where a business under receivership suffered a no notifiable data breach incident. Uh, I think some of you asked that question before. Uh, it, it certainly can expose uh, the, the practitioner to liability, but it also has the unfortunate effect of raising the profile of that transaction to the privacy commissioner. So, which is going to bring more attention to the, the whether or not the transfer of the customer information uh, is going to be proper or allowed under the under the proposed sale, for example. Um, what what you need to do with respect to the register of consent, and particularly uh, register unsubscribes, um, which goes along with it, is you need them in order to work out who the business can legitimately contact, uh, which is important in a asset sale where, for example, you want to sell the entire database to a purchaser. Um, and therefore you need to work out whether you can do that and whether or not a purchaser can subsequently utilize that database. Um, what a business produces in response to your request will inform you really whether or not there is in fact a asset class per se. Ideally, you want the business, just as I said before, point you to the integrated CRM system where all of the information is stored. And what you really don't want is a, is a manually maintained Excel spreadsheet, as I mentioned before, that, that would be the wrong answer for a business to give. Um, I mentioned the privacy commissioner here uh, because the commission has statutory rights to ask questions. Uh, and also to conduct actual formal investigations into possible privacy interference. And sometimes we do see questions being asked as part of a transaction, um, particularly for high profile businesses. And they may ask questions. And I think what you need to, what you'd be mindful of is to answer these questions quickly um, to, to avoid them, well, doing a bit more formal investigation and potentially um, uh, injunct or do some other actions to block a sale, to block a sale process. Um, I'll just go to some of the questions. So one of the questions, Kachi, was um, how do you find the register of data breaches and security incidents? Ah, yes. So um, so there, there is no such thing per se. Um, the, the Privacy Commission or the Office of 
um, Australian Information Commissioner, the OEIC.gov.au, uh, maintains a register of complaints, um, but there is no register of father breaches per se. The, the information submitted as part of mandatory data breach notification generally is kept confidentially by the OAIC. It feeds into their quarterly reports, I think, just to provide information about um, uh, what are the type of data breaches out there. But there's no general database for you to search, well, the test so-and-so actually suffered a data breach. Um, there is a register if someone actually made a complaint, for example, a formal complaint that the that the commissioner needs to deal with, and and there is a there is a separate um, register for that. Um, and then um, so go. Brent, we're sort of in your hands. Sorry. We're at time. Yeah. yeah. Did you want us to take some of these away and sort of respond, and you can circulate them internally? Let's You've let's got a query. Let's do that. I I, I do note that um, everyone should have, probably have a look at. Uh, the questions, some have been answered online in the chat screen, one particularly um, that David Holton asked, um, which Natasha has responded about, um, you know, IP rights and, and uh, proceedings and, uh, and I suppose the protection of the voluntary administration against uh, proceedings. Um, so Sam has, uh, sorry, um, Natasha's answered that. I I've asked about, um, which, which are all IP assets? Um, <laughs> which accounting uh, standard do you want, Brent? <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm interested in that. I'm, I'm you know, when it particularly. Well, when yeah, we'll take that away. The answer I'm reliably informed by my co-panelists is it's complicated. Oh, it's complicated. Yeah, that's that's um, fake. It depends on the asset and the security, so it varies. Can, can, I, can I just, um, sorry, there's a point question just popped on. In fact, there was one thing that I was going to mention just before we, we wrap, and that's to do with Spam Act. Um, and this is relating to the final question, well, the last question on, on, the, on, the, um, on the forum, which says, in the liquid agent scenario where there may be a customer database, which we deem to be high value, but there's no consent register, are we able to send a notification to those customers listed that we intend to include the information in the sale and give them the opportunity to opt out prior to completing the sale? Does this effectively mitigate the privacy risk? Uh, that is a very interesting question. And, um, and what I was going to point to as my final comment was around the SPAM Act, which is separate compared with the, with the Privacy Act. So uh, the SPAM Act prohibits any electronic commercial communications made by business to an individual unless there is consent. Uh, and it's important, particularly for, for um, liquidators, because unlike the Privacy Act, which is at, at least at this stage, um, relatively, I suppose, teethless in, in one sense, because you need to enforce your privacy rights and the, and the commission needs to take some actions. The Spam Act, on the other hand, has a traffic ticket type of infringement fines, and they rack up on a per fine per day basis. And we've had a situation, I think Woolworths recently got fined about over a million dollars because they had an automated system which just keeps sending out emails and um, it was considered to be contrary to the Spam Act and they racked up fines really, really quickly. So, um, and sending out emails, particularly electronic emails to existing customers, which has not got a consent, you may trigger, you may, you may be considered to be sending out a commercial electronic message without, without consent by asking that very question. In fact, if you go to the um, ACMA website, one of the FAQs specifically deal with this issue. Namely, uh, there is a risk that asking, sending an email out, asking an individual, do they like to opt out of an email, of an email list, for example, may itself be considered a spam and therefore um, potentially subject to, um, uh, to, the, to the penalty. So uh, that may not necessarily mitigate your privacy risk, but instead, depending again, depending on the scenario, very much introduce one as well. So uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude that before I'm, I hand it back to any other further questions, but that I think I'll just uh, point that out. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I really appreciate it. You've got, you know, 70 odd people from, you know, around the world listening to you today. And, and um, we really appreciate your time. Um, Natasha, Francis, Kachi, Bernard, appreciate your time. Um, very informative topic if i'll be interested um you know in a couple of those questions if we can get 
your sort of views, but particularly one that, you know, that FEG, I know that FEG is, uh, is one that we want to make sure that we don't get on the wrong side, particularly when we're doing a transaction and um, we have to separate it by asset class. Um, but uh, yeah, just some general knowledge on that would be great. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity from all of us here at Norton Rose Fulbright. Um, and, you know, we're always happy to chat. You pick up the phone, phone a friend, phone your lawyers. Yep. And what's, <laughs> what's the, it, a passing comment from ev everyone is the insolvency world. We're going to get busy. Natasha, what do you think? Oh, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. I'm, an, I'm a glass half full person despite... Yeah, you know, working in the insolvency and restructuring space. It's it's yeah, it's it's funny, and we're talking offline about um, the potential increase in the threshold amounts for the small business restructures, which um, yeah, Natasha was saying that it's probably going to go to five mil, and Arita sort of said the same thing this morning to their committee members. Um, I just I just don't think there's the pressure at the moment from the ATO, which often drives. Um, you know, insolvency events. And the ones that we are seeing, I think when we've spoken about this in our business development groups internationally, well, particularly nationally, is that um, the ones we are seeing are with huge amount of ATO debt, huge amount of ATO debt. So they've been sitting on, you know, accumulating lots of ATO debt and collecting JobKeeper at the same time. So uh, we just need some pressure there. But anyway. All right. Thanks, Thank thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. See you next time. All the best. <laughs> Bye.